the law and you a look at laws in st vincent and the grenadines which affect our daily lives the law and you presented by lawyer panel r campbell qc and brought to you on svg tv as a public service ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters boys and girls greetings welcome to another presentation in this public service nation building series the law and you this is program number 986 coming to you on Monday, the 12th of October, 2020. On this program, I will speak to you on the topic, the philosophy of adverse possession of land. <laughs> Quite a mouthful. The philosophy of adverse possession of land. And we're going to look at the topic from a scholarly point of view. But before getting into the topic, a few short preliminary comments. Firstly, and as usual, I would like to send out my condolences to all families which have suffered recent bereavements. And in particular, the family of the late student of the girls' high school, Miss Kaylee Robertson, whose grandmother is a deaconess in my church. Kaylee herself worshipped elsewhere, but Deaconess Velma Robertson has been a stalwart of St. Elizabeth Spiritual Baptist Church, and on behalf of the whole church family and the Archdiocese, I send condolences to Sister Velma and all those who mourn the loss of young Kaylee Robertson. In that connection, let me hail up my good friend Delano, who laid his mum to rest recently. Delano boy, I know what it is, but as a lively and optimistic person, and as a spiritual man, I am sure that you will get over the immediate grief in time. But we will all remember your mum, Miss Clydeth DuPont. Now, on behalf of His Eminence Archbishop Melford Pompey, I would like to say thank you to all those persons who attended Synod yesterday, Synod 2020 and hope that you found the occasion edifying. You'll be hearing more from the Archbishop in due course. Finally, I saw a, a notice in the, well, the two publications that I normally would look at for news on the web, Eyewitness News and News 784, both carried a press release from Mrs. Anesia Richards Batiste announcing that she has resigned from leadership of the Democratic Republican Party, has resigned from politics, and is going into full-time ministry, excuse me. On behalf of the nation, I would like to thank the sister for the service she has given in the political field, albeit short. Many of you don't appreciate the courage it takes for a person, particularly a young person, to come out as a political leader. Of course, Sister Anesia is a brilliant student, has distinguished herself in St. Vincent Grenadines and abroad, and she played a very prominent part in the 
recent politics, well, not too recent, but a few years ago. She was a senator in the House of Assembly, then she resigned from the party to which she was affiliated and started her own political party and didn't do too well, but she made herself known by her frequent television and other presentations. And even though I clashed with her on several occasions and did not see eye to eye with her, yet she earned my respect for her courage and the clarity with which she expressed herself and the, the absolute ferocity of her views. Of course, I had known her as a child growing up in the streams of power church. Her mother, Miss o Mrs. Octavia Richards, was, is one of the still, one of the leading vocalists in streams of power. And her father, Mr. Malcolm Richards, was a good friend and even client of mine. And uh, Anisia grew up in the streams of power church where she got her early Christian foundation. So my sister, all the very best as you go forward in the vineyard of the Lord. And I wish you all the very best. And once again, on behalf of the people of this country, I thank you for the service you give in the political field. And I'm sure the people look forward to the service you will give as a leader in the propagation of the gospel of Christ. All right, we come to the topic for the evening, the philosophy of adverse possession of land. To break down the word philosophy a bit, it means that we are going to look at what are the things which led to the whole system of adverse possession? What, is the, what are the foundations of adverse possession? How did it come about? Where did it come about? And to what extent is it widespread or otherwise in the world? Well, adverse possession is a concept in law which, to put it in a nutshell, means that after a person has possessed a parcel of land for a given period as owner of the land, without having permission of anybody, without purchasing the land, without renting the land, then the law says after a certain period, that person who is in occupation of that piece of land as owner is liable to claim it and take it as his or hers. I would like to emphasize to you that adverse possession doesn't mean that if you have been living on a piece of land or working a piece of land for umpteen years, you can claim it. It all depends on whether your occupation of the land was done with somebody's permission or whether you, have a special, you had a special arrangement with somebody, the real owner of the land to occupy the land for a given period of time. So just because you have been occupying a piece of land doesn't mean you can go and claim it. And those persons who are interested in finding out their status with respect to a particular parcel of land should go and seek legal advice. I am going to shock you very shortly by showing the attitude of the law towards adverse possession. 
as opposed to the attitude of the law towards other things. The concept of adverse possession, I'll come to that just now, and you'll be shocked. <laughs> but the concept of adverse possession is a concept in British land law, or land law which sprung from the old English common law, and it is found in many other countries. It was found in all countries that formerly belonged as part of the British Empire. And to some extent, you find it in other systems of law. Now, just how widespread it is in different systems of law, I do not know. I have not done research into that topic. So, for example, I do not know the extent to which it is grounded in, say, Roman Dutch law or civil law or even Islamic law. I don't know what if they have similar concepts of adverse possession, perhaps somebody listening to me who is a student might be able to do research later on and write a thesis on the comparative analysis of adverse possession in English common law as compared to Islamic law. So where it has spread to or where it originated from, I'm not sure, but it is fundamentally part and parcel of English land law from the earliest days of the development of English land law. And it is based on the general philosophy on which English land law was developed, as you would have heard me say in the last two programs, that all land in England, and by extension their dominions and colonies when the time came for colonization, all land sprung from the crown. The crown was the ultimate owner, the ultimate landlord of all land, and everybody held their piece and parcel of land as a grant from the crown. So the abiding philosophy of English land law is that the land is meant to be used and enjoyed by those who are alive at a given time with limited rights to the restrictions you can make to dictate to future generations what use they should make of the land. And therefore, English land law is based not so much on the concept of the ownership of land, but on the use of the land. And therefore, the abiding idea behind English land law is if you have land in your name and you don't put it to use and somebody else does, then in most cases you can lose your right to use that land in favor of the person who has made use of it. In other words, if you have land, you use it. Don't leave it idle because Land is the heritage of mankind, so the English philosophy goes, and it is for the existing present generation of each period of time to use and pass on to their heirs and successors when they die. And this emphasis, therefore, that the English land law has placed on using land is the idea that underlies the whole notion of adverse possession. This is how it works, and this is the part I told you you, you would find interesting and amusing, and some may find it shocking. Okay, suppose I 
purchase a parcel of land anywhere in St. Vincent. Say, I, I have purchased an acre of land. Suppose it's mountain land. Let us say an acre of land somewhere in a nearby mountain. I get a title deed for it. I have it registered. I pay taxes for it. It is my land. I use the land primarily for farming. I grow crops on the land. I have a few fruit trees. Maybe I have a breadfruit tree, a nice cocoa bread breadfruit tree on the land. Maybe I have a tamarind tree down the bottom, which I might be able to use because tamarind trees like to harbor Jack Spaniards, in fact, Jack Spaniards love to build nests in tamarind trees, so you have to be very careful. But they may have fruit trees on the land and, and in places of the land, I may have cultivated with root crops, a little dashi in here, some edos there, potatoes there, yams there, and so forth. Chuck a few pigeon peas here and there, and I'm cultivating my one acre of land because it is mine. I have my title deed, and nobody can challenge me for it. But on that land, I also have a little watch house because I need a shed to store my things and so on. Occasionally, I take a nap in there. Although I have to be careful with Sandapi if you're going to sleep in a watch house. But, so I have a watch house on my one acre of land. And it's in a nearby mountain, you know, within a mile of the village. So I can, an easy walk. And then I decided I am going to travel. I'm going abroad, say as a farm worker, to Canada. So I leave my land there, lock up the watch house, don't put anybody in charge, just leave the land and they go to Canada as a farm worker. Things break okay for me in Canada. I meet a young lady, fall in love, get married and have a few children. And after a while, I'm in Canada, six, seven, eight years, 10 years, 12 years, 13 years. So I have been away from my land for 13 years. I haven't left anybody in charge. But every year, I send back a little bit of money for a relative of mine to go and pay my land taxes. Not much, $10 a year. Okay. So I, I have my relative keep my tax receipts. Now, if as soon as I have left St. Vincent, somebody walls in my one acre of land, and start to cultivate it for their own benefit. Suppose they have a piece of land not far from mine and they move my watch house from my land where it is and carry it and erect it on their piece of land. So they have taken my watch house, not intending to return it, taking it and working my land. In other words, they have taken my land. And they do that for more than 12 years. And then in year 13, having been abroad, I come back, or year 14 or year 15. But essentially, I have left the land for 12 years, clear. And somebody has occupied it for that 12 years as if it is theirs, planting it up, reaping my fruits and so on. 
So I decided to come back to St. Vincent after that length of time. And when I come back to St. Vincent, somebody says to me, wait, you see that piece of land you there? A mountain? John Jones, take it, you know, and take out papers for it, and say you have title lead for it, and claiming that is his now. And I would say, how we could do that? I have my title deed. I've been paying my taxes every year. How we could claim and take the land? And I carry out inquiries and find that after 12 years, John Jones, who had occupied my land, went to a lawyer. took out legal proceedings on the Depossessory Titles Act of 2004, published them in the newspaper, and eventually he was able to prove that he had been occupying and cultivating and using my land as the owner of it. And the judge has ordered the registrar to sign a title deed for John Jones, giving him my land. And I would say, well, you're crazy, what, what kind of law do you have here? Well, not all, it's the same laws in Canada too, not just here alone. And I would discover that there is nothing I could do about that once Mr. Jones had taken my land, used it as his own, and had gone through the proper legal channels and done the proper thing, and had gone before the judge, and had proved that he was the one using the land, working the land, as the owner of the land. And in that 12 years, nobody had challenged him. So I would be faced with a situation in which the law would have allowed Mr. Jones to keep my land as his. He would have a title deed from the courthouse. And my title deed would count as nothing. I might as well tear it up. But <laughs> I have an inspiration, so I go to the police. I said, you see that watch house that he has on his piece of land? That is my watch house which he stole when he occupied my land. The police can bring a charge against Mr. Jones for stealing my watch house. And Mr. Jones can end up in jail for stealing my watch house. <laughs> that is... That is why I told you you, you, you you might find this funny. Because the law does not countenance the taking of possession of personal property. No matter for how long. If you steal something from somebody, there's no statute of limitation to say, well, after 12 years or 20 years, you can carry him to court. It doesn't matter how long. If you can prove that he stole it from you, somebody stole something from somebody, they can be charged once the evidence is there. So, after my 12, 13, 14 years in Canada, I would have a right to bring a criminal action, a criminal case against Mr. Jones for stealing my watch house. but I can't do a thing against him for stealing my land. That is the part that I think you would find. Some may find it startling. Some may know that that is the law because some people are acquainted with the law. But some may find it strange. How could 
a man practically steal your land and not only is he in a position where I cannot do anything about it through the legal system, but the court actually rewards him for the theft of my land by giving him a title lead for it. And yet the same court will be willing to send him to jail for stealing my watch house and moving it from my land. That is because in English law, the concept of land is separate from the concept of personal property. Land is regarded as something which is incapable of being stolen. So when I said just now that somebody would have stolen your land, I was used saying colloquially because in law, you cannot steal land. If you use land against the wishes or even knowledge of the owner, the owner can bring an action against you for trespassing. But land is regarded as something which, which you cannot take and carry away. And therefore, it will be not be the subject of a criminal charge of theft. So the moral of that is that the law allows somebody to use land which you own but are not using. And the law gives you 12 years to bring an action against them to get it back if they are using your land without your permission or as adverse possessors, as squatters, if you like. So you can steal a pen, you can steal clothes, you can steal vehicles, you can steal a boat, you can steal fruits, you can steal animals, but you can steal land. <laughs> and you are penalized for stealing all of those things, but you are rewarded for stealing, I inverted commas, stealing land. Because the philosophy of the law is that land is there to be used and not just to have a tight lead put away. Now, if you didn't go away, you didn't even have to work the land. If it's there, the land is there, you have a tight lead, you can just simply go and look at your land every day. You don't have to cultivate it. But the minute somebody steps in and trespasses on that land, you carry them to court and bring an action of trespass against them. In other words, the law gives you the right to protect your land. But if you don't use that right for at least 12 years in a row, you lose the right. So you use land, or in some circumstances, you lose the land. And that is the philosophy behind adverse possession of land. The law allows strangers to come and take your land and use it as owners if you don't make sure that you have somebody in charge of the land, assuming you're not available to be in charge yourself. All right? Now, um, elections having been declared, I will do a program the first Monday after nomination day to give my synopsis of the political scenario with regard to candidacy. But one has to wait until nomination day to see precisely who would have been nominated. Until then, here is hoping that you would enjoy yourselves, be careful now that 
the election season has been declared in earnest. Don't get into any trouble. Limit your argumentation with people over politics. Don't go ahead, boss, because of politics. Please. All right, so until next Monday, DV, when I present another edition of The Law and You, here is hoping that you would have a pleasant week, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, and may the good Lord continue to bless us all. The Law and You, a look at laws in St. Vincent and the Grenadines which affect our daily lives. The Law and You, presented by lawyer panel R. Campbell, QC, and brought to you on SVG TV as a public service.